The Gladstone Gig by Your Nomad Soul Roland Miles is the kind of guy you always see but never meet. He's got that familiar sort of face that you spot from across a crowded room and swear you've seen it somewhere before. Roland's been around this block and the next and a dozen more, always leaving before he gets noticed. He doesn't stroll and he doesn't skulk. He doesn't barge in and demand attention but he doesn't hide away. He goes exactly where he means to and does exactly what he wants but you would never notice. In conversation, he'll say exactly what he has to, and no more. You won't find many like Roland Miles. He doesn't play the game. Sir Thomas Gladstone is nothing like Roland Miles. Gladstone is large and loud, both in physique and character. He is a foul-mouthed, cherry-faced behemoth of a man who is well known to be very friendly with his ever-present bottle of brandy. Photographs will tell you that Sir Thomas was once a poster boy, with those classic good looks that we all love to loathe. There is much speculation as to how Sir Thomas Gladstone came to be a Sir in the first place. The official reason was services to the Crown. But the smart money says he wants Roger de Majesty and got knighted in exchange for keeping quiet. Whatever the reason the Queen had for knighting him doesn't change the fact that he is very popular and not very well liked, which suits him perfectly. All the pomp and circumstance that surrounds Sir Thomas Gladstone is simply a facade, a rock-solid alibi to cover any and all underhanded dealings. Brandy does not buy itself. Sir Thomas Gladstone is the game. And where else is a game like Gladstone to be found but at the Montego Hotel and Casino? Not quite five star, but only just. Tonight, Sir Thomas Gladstone is entertaining, although which definition you choose is entirely down to your tastes and sensibilities. Miles hates hotels. Funny little soaps, funny little fridges, a seemingly endless supply of naughty blue movies at ridiculous prices. It's all enough to make him gag. To him, a hotel is nothing more than an uncomfortable necessity, no matter how many stars it claims to have. It makes you wonder, of course, why Roland Miles is here then, on this particular night of nights. Sir Thomas Gladstone is the only reason Miles is here, and it has nothing to do with Sir Thomas Gladstone himself, but we'll get to that in a moment. First, the stage must be set. The bulbous Sir Thomas Gladstone is currently in the verbose incontinent pig's bar, surrounded by a gaggle of giggling Gladstoners and already consuming brandy by the bottle. His lips are wet and sticky, spewing splashes of spittle with every spate of slurred speech. That's how Miles would put it. He has a thing for alliteration. Miles is not part of that crowd. He's sitting silently in a little booth beside them, listening in and waiting for Gladstone to tell someone what he needs to know. At the same time, Miles is watching everywhere else in the bar, making sure that dear Sir Thomas hasn't been put on the menu by anyone else. Tommy dear, tell us about the diamond. Shh, you're not supposed to know, you naughty thing. Miles rolls his eyes. Nobody sees. Gold diggers, all of them. Even the men, sitting there sucking up as much free booze as they can in hopes of something more substantial. Gladstone is a lonely man. However, this is the question Miles has been waiting to hear. Come on, Sir Thomas, old boy. Gladly tell us about those stones. 
It, it's more than a, just a single diamond, you know. It's a, it's a substantial collection of the Russian crown jewels that were lost when the Bolsheviks got a little rowdy that one time. And tomorrow, they'll be sold to a very reputable jeweler for a, a tidy little fortune. The titters from the table become almost cacophonous, specifically in the treble range. Miles grinds his teeth to stop himself from high-fiving faces. A couple of surly gentlemen a little ways over take time out from a heated, foreign-sounding conversation to look at Gladstone's gaggle with disdain. They could spell trouble later. Miles makes a mental note of their faces. At least the ice is still here. Sir Thomas Gladstone would not trouble himself to travel so far from his usual haunts if he were not determined to make a personal delivery. All that Miles needs now is Gladstone's room number and some time. Time, though, shouldn't be a problem. Sir Thomas Gladstone is only on bottle two. Miles pulls the mobile out of his jacket pocket and types a quick text before he gets up and leaves. Front entrance, now. Destiny is a prostitute. She's on the game, as they say. The best way to describe her is to say she was pretty once upon a time. Many moons of nighttime tomfoolery for money have left her with that drawn out hangdog look of your garden variety, Tom. But Miles told her it's 500 for a quick convincing word with reception, and that's all. Money for nothing at all, as far as she's concerned. Miles comes out and asks her if she has a light. She does. He tells her the name of her mark as he blows smoke into the air, before he says thanks and goes off to lean against a lamppost like some sort of Humphrey Bogart. She knows the plan, though. Straight up to the nervous string bean at reception. He looks like a stickler, so she decides to lean a little further and speak a little huskier than usual. I was sent here for Sir Thomas Gladstone. A special gift from a secret admirer. Add a wink and the poor boy is so flustered he forgets to object. I'll just uh, go and, and c- c- call him Mom. She smiles and thinks, boys. Although she likes the sound of mom, she doesn't hear that often. She needs to stick to her instructions, though. It's not often she gets a half night. No, no, dear. I'm a surprise, see? I'm supposed to go up to his room and wait for him. The receptionist tries not to let on how much he wishes that would happen to him. Well, I, I, I can't issue you a room key without Mr. Sir uh, Gladstone signing for it. I've got a key. She flashes the white plastic card Miles gave to her earlier, just in case. It isn't for Sir Thomas's room, but that doesn't matter. The cars themselves all look the same, so it's up to each room's occupants to know which room is theirs. Although, as Destiny notes, she could have shown the lad a candy pink card and he wouldn't have noticed. She presses on. I I just forgot the room number, silly me. It's been a crazy night so far. Well, I don't. Come on, love. Please. She leans forward just that little bit extra as she says please. Almost like a promise, but more like a tease. It works, though. Oh, all right. Give me a sec. Uh, 2164. Yeah. Destiny brightens up and delivers a bouncy, Thanks, hun. Before heading back out the front entrance, saying something about handcuffs. The receptionist looks a bit lost for a while after that. Miles has just finished his smoke as Destiny struts past him and tells him Sir Thomas Gladstone's room number. 2164. He responds with tulips before walking back inside. Sure enough, Destiny finds her 500 quid in a cigarette packet tossed beside the tulips that decorate the Montego's front steps. 
Money for nothing at all. In the meantime, Roland Miles makes his way to the men's. He's not going to see a man about a dog. He's going to get his kit. Third cubicle from the left in the system. It says out of order, but that's because Miles made friends with one of the cleaning ladies. The system thus stays dry, the cubicle remains vacant, and no one complains because the sign says that the hotel is looking into it. The hotel doesn't even know. Miles grabs the black backpack and stuffs it under his jacket. A sudden beer belly is harder to notice than a sudden backpack, especially if you wear it right. Up until now, the CCTV has only managed to see Miles' back and sort of profile. Miles heads for floor 36, just below the first of the penthouse floors. It's as high up as he could afford. Gladstone always books the top floor penthouse, but never stays there if he's on business. Of course, the Gladstoners will gladly join him when he suggests they move the party upstairs. They'll cause enough chaos up there for him to discreetly stumble down to his real room before his passes out. Alibis. But that's at least two hours from now, so Miles has time to do what he does best. Miles booked two rooms on this floor, under two different names, with four different keys. Not a small feat, if you ask him. That's four signatures, four disguises, and two distinct reasons for checking in separately. However, because the rooms are on opposite sides of the building, no one will notice, despite the fact that each room is precisely halfway along each side of the building. Gladstone stones are in 2164, 15 floors down and 4 units west of this one, room 3660, is about as lucky as Miles could get. Only 8 or 9 windows to traverse, but still enough distance to rule him out once they start investigating. See, 18 or so floors from which to descend, and you add to that even 2 rooms on either side and you've got enough paperwork for a good 6 months. That's more than enough time to disappear, even in the case of a straight drop. Now Miles is the kind of criminal who likes to do his own work, cover his bases as the Yanks say. Miles pulls the backpack out of his front and takes off his jacket, replacing it with a black leather turtleneck that he zips all the way up. He grabs his gloves off the bedside table before opening up his backpack. He never handles the contents with his bare hands, just in case he has to ditch them in the middle of a job. He pulls out his trusty Descendomatic, or at least that's what Miles calls it. He got it as a gift from his mentor, just before his mentor went to prison after the Louvre fiasco, which Miles still insists wasn't his fault. This trusty little companion can clamp on just about any surface and be removed without a trace. Next, Miles takes out a harness, puts it on, and clips it to the cables coming out of the device. The Sendomatic is then returned to the backpack, which Miles hoists up and puts the wrong way around. That way, he can get to all the necessaries at a moment's notice. Now for the tricky bit. Roland Miles hates heights, but he hates prison more, so he sucks it up and climbs out the window and refuses to look down at the 36 story drop that's waiting if he mucks this part of the job up. He could pass for Spider-Man the way he makes his way across the outside of the building. Four units over and he's hanging one-handed from the outside of a windowsill as he fishes his secret weapon out of his kit. He reaches up and puts the Descendomatic in the space between the windows and activates the clamps. A couple of tugs just to make sure before he lets go and falls. A grand total of three feet before the contraption's cable pull tight and save his life. He takes a moment to calm his nerves and say a little prayer of thanks and sorry for what I'm about to do and then he uses a little remote from his kit to start the winch. It's slow but steady going, maybe even a little relaxing. Miles counts the floors as they creep past. In about two minutes, he reaches the 21st floor and stops the winch. He does a quick metal check of the schematics he memorised, just to be sure of whether he should go through the left window or the right window. Something in his kit buzzes, annoyingly loud too. 
This is an independent gig, so nobody should be changing orders on him. He pulls the mobile out and groans when he sees who it is. Mum, I'm in a meeting. I'll phone you back later, all right? Yeah, yeah, no, it, it's all going fine. Of course. What's he done now? Yeah, well, I... Look, you're... He, no, no, look... Can we, can we discuss this? I'll phone you back in a little bit and we, we can discuss this later, yeah? Yeah? All right, love you too. Love you too. See you later, Mum. All right. Yeah. Yeah. All right, bye. He hangs up and heads for the window on the right. It isn't locked. Gladstone obviously likes a bit of a draft. That's the second lucky break Miles has had tonight. He climbs through the window and into the room and unclips his harness. Roland Miles doesn't waste time. The sooner he finds the ice, the sooner he can get out. The room is standard hotel fare. Two single beds, a kettle, a bar fridge and a cupboard. There's a decorative plastic fern in the one corner but nothing else. This, uh, this room could pass for unoccupied if the cupboard wasn't standing a little ajar. Miles spots a fur coat hanging above a pair of duffel bags through the crack. Naturally, he goes there first. The duffel bags only contain clothes. One is obviously a man's and the other is a woman's, which confuses Miles. Why would Gladstone have a woman's luggage in his room? He usually only travels with Gary, his bodyguard. Miles assumes that this is just an extra part of the ruse, possibly even the bodyguard's idea. When Miles spots the little gun safe that comes standard with the room, he almost laughs. Firstly, it's a dead giveaway to put the diamonds in there, and second, it has a digital locking mechanism, which allows each guest to program their own locking code every time. Now the problem with these safes comes down to the fact that it isn't uncommon for people to forget what passcode they use to lock it. So, every model has a little USB port on the side for when the locksmith comes calling. Of course, any thief worth his salt knows how to use the USB port to activate the override. Miles pulls out his phone and hooks it up to the safe. Using an app that a friend of his designed, he has the safe open in under 10 seconds. Too easy. Inside, Miles finds a briefcase. Not one of those silver heavy duty types that's like putting up a big red sign that says, Look, valuables! But instead, just a normal brown leather one. It's heavy though, which strikes Miles as odd. It must be about 20 pounds. Probably a metal lining and some extra security, but that's a problem for upstairs. Miles is just about to turn around and head for the window when he hears the room's door click open. The window is too far away, which leaves only two hiding spots, under the bed and in the cupboard. Miles chooses option two and buries himself in the fur coat, clutching the briefcase to his chest. He counts four voices, two of which have Russian accents. It must be those two fellows from down in the bar. The other two voices belong to a man and a woman, both local sounding. At present, the penny is in the air for Roland Miles. He's wondering what all these people are doing in Gladstone's room. You have merchandise? Of course. Merchandise? Could they mean the stones? If that's the case, then why the hell is Gladstone not here doing the deal? So much for reputable jewellers. Have you noticed yet that Roland Miles' meticulous preparations for this job have left him blind to the glaringly obvious fact of his situation? Then we make deals so we can go home, eh? 50,000 per kilo, no? Correct. The penny finally drops and Miles realises he's in the wrong cupboard, in the wrong room, holding the wrong briefcase. He looks down at what is obviously the merchandise and truly comprehends the saltiness of his current pickle. 
Hang on, he thinks. I can't be more than one room over. What are the odds of a drug deal next door? He doesn't have time to calculate those odds because the woman of the group opens up the cupboard, forcing poor Roland Miles to retreat even further into the folds of the fur coat. Thankfully, she's a bit too preoccupied with the fact that the safe is open and empty to notice Miles's feet behind her duffel bag. Naturally, there's an awkward silence. The lady heads for the gentleman and whispers something to him, probably along the lines of, it's gone. The Russians don't take too kindly to this. You don't have time to waste. Do you have 10 kilos or not? Um, someone seems to have uh, taken the um, merchandise, sir. You, you mean to say stolen? Yes. Miles cringes. Thugs don't have patience. The Russians spend five seconds discussing this new development with each other before deciding to start shooting. They brought suppressors with them, so all Miles hears is thuds and wax and two bodies hitting the floor. Miles himself is unscathed, but a stray bullet hits the briefcase and sends a cloud of white powder into the air. Silence descends on the room, and all Miles can hear is the heavy breathing of two very pumped up goons. And then Roland Miles sneezes. To be fair, it isn't his fault, but a sneeze in a silent room is like a fart in the cinema during the quiet, serious bit. It's bound to attract unwanted attention. Miles has five seconds before the Russians open the cupboard door, so he decides to drop the briefcase and put the fur coat on. The closet opens up and Miles looks down two very long barrels at two very confused and impatient Russians. Turns out it was the two from down the bar. Fancy that. Miles decides to talk first and talk fast. Oh my God, I thought I was going to have to spend the whole night in there. You know, I was only up here because Maria was having yet another crisis, you know, and she was just yapping on and on and on about that slut Georgiana. Such a waste of a pretty face, if you ask me, and a total B word too. And I saw this coat and I was like, hello, beautiful. And then she just closed the door on me. I know. I know, right? What an idiot. I've been in there for hours, you know, and then you guys show up and start doing I don't know what. I, I was scared half to death, honey. Oh, my. Oh, my. Have you boys made a mess? You know, I'll just pop I'll just pop down and get room service, yes? Uh, oh, by the way, doll, that fern looks a little dry. Miles gets halfway down the corridor before one of them finally manages to say, It's plastic fern. At this point, Roland Miles can only think one simple thought. Run, Miles. Run. Okay, it's done now.